Hello, everybody. I'm Sean Reynolds from Sportsnet, about to be joined by not Ken Weeb from the Winnipeg Free Press. That will be later in the show. About to be joined by Jeff Hamilton of the Winnipeg Free Press. And this is the Kenny and Rennie show after a game in which I, I don't think there's many of you out there who are going to be happy with that. I doubt it. You want to know why we're bringing in Hammy and we're not bringing in Kent? I know there's a lot of you out there will say, it's no big deal. They're just doing this. They're just taking it easy. The real team will show up in a little bit of time. And those of you out there who like to say that, like the positive sunny outlook that Ken will bring quite often to this podcast, telling you everything's all right, rubbing your back, getting you a glass of warm milk, maybe some cookies if you're good. Uh, because we know when ham Hammer comes in, he brings the hammer. He doesn't bring the warm milk. He doesn't bring the cookies. He, like Rennie, will bring the truth. And maybe a dose of truth is what's needed after this game before we end it by bringing in Ken and the milk and cookies and those kind of things. Uh, because if you're looking for the positives of this game, I guess there are some in there. You know, some of you will take a look at the shot count and say, you know what? It was a closer game than everyone said. Everyone's everyone just needs to relax. That was a really close game. Score effects, schmore effects. The Winnipeg Jets were right there. Um, those of you who need that kind of reassurance, it's coming at the end. Uh, you're not going to get it for a little while though you're gonna have to hold out for about you know 40 minutes i think before that's going to arrive in the meantime i'm going to try to give you a little bit of the truth i don't know how much there is that i need to say about that game that someone who is looking with an unvarnished view is not going to pick up terrible terrible defensive structure to that game i mean you take a look one after the other with these goals uh you know sixth goal of the game is the jets essentially getting out competed the first goal of the game uh is three jets players standing around a guy who goes to the middle and i know that uh, it's mishandled by the defenseman uh but it's just a a islanders player ready to pounce on the play uh and three jets players surrounding him who are not the second goal of that game i know jamie mclennan uh, was breaking it down in the first intermission, suggested it was the kind of goal that Connor Hellebuck should have had. I don't necessarily pin this one on Count Connor Hellebuck. What I do uh, take away from that situation is the third line is on for this, and it is essentially a two-on-one, and there are three Jets players standing in the neutral zone that are closer to their own net than the next closest Islanders player, and that Islanders player is able to skate right through those players not one of them seemed to notice him to make it a two-on-one in this situation and what that does is it forces the Jets defender who is not really in that situation expecting it to be a two-on-one all of a sudden he's presented with one and finds himself in no man's land which means he's not able to jump and take the player and take the pass away and allow the goaltender to force it or pressure the puck carrier in this case cal clutterbuck uh and what that does is it allows him to come in and take that shot and whip it past the goaltender this is a defenseman being caught in no man's land you will find often Defenders get caught in no man's land when the team is not playing a proper defensive structure. To me, that is what happens in this situation here. And Connor Hellebuck gets beat. I mean, is it one that he maybe should have had? I, I, possibly, but I'm not going to say this is definitely a bad goal. This is a guy being able to skate into a, a hard area and basically be uncontested. And Connor Hellebuck in this situation, because the defender is caught in no man's land, has to give credence to the possibility of a pass, can't focus fully on the shot, and it's in the back of than that the third goal in this instance a lot of you are going to take a look and say nick Ehlers was lazy getting back into the play on this one this is not the case uh there's it's essentially a two on two um and uh uh, Nick Ehlers, this is not his man. It's Josh Morrissey's man. Josh Morrissey bails on the play, heads to, I don't know where in this case, but it's another scenario by which a two-on-one is created where the original defender on the puck carrier cannot focus on that man. And Nikolai Ehlers is now trying to jump back into the play to cover a man that wasn't his. Uh, and essentially, that's how the two-on-one opens up and it ends up in the back of the net. This was just time and time and time again in this game, a scenario by which the Jets were either outcompeted 
and it ended up in the back of their net or absolutely blue coverage and it ends up in the back of their net. Uh, gone is the daunting five on five team, at least in this game that we know defensively of the Winnipeg Jets. This was a big swing and a big miss by this team on this night on all accounts. The 6-3 score, this, uh, you know, the three goals that are scored to kind of get them back into this. I take a look at this uh, halfway through this game. The shots are, are, the Jets were able to get up about five shots halfway through this game, I believe was the number at that stage. Uh, completely unacceptable. Um, not there, not in this game at all at any point. 6 3 score to me. The shots at the end of this game, this is in the window dressing category. This is lipstick on a pig category. The Jets got pumped in this game and looked nothing like themselves um, in the process. Did not handle the pressure of the New York Islanders well in this game. And I wanted to just kind of bring this up. We've had this conversation about, you know, the Jets and how they fare against teams above the playoff line, against where they uh, where they are below the playoff line. We all took, and I'm as guilty as anyone, we all took a look at that game against the New York Rangers where the Jets elevated their game. And took that as evidence that the Jets, yes, are able to handle it in big games like that. I'm starting to say, if you take a look at this, you have to start viewing that game not as what the Jets turn themselves into in the right moments, but as an outlier. That's an outlier game at this stage if you're taking a look at what they've done against really good teams because their response since against two teams that are out of the playoffs, but two teams that are fighting to kind of stay in the playoffs has been unacceptable the last two games. Dan Robertson said it going into that game at the start of the broadcast. It was an off game. It was a bad game by the Winnipeg Jets. That's not the Winnipeg Jets. What we saw from the Jets against the New York Rangers is the Winnipeg Jets. I think we're being rather presumptuous at this stage of the season to say that what we saw from the Winnipeg Jets is who the Jets are and what we've seen from them the last two games is not who the Jets are. If it's not presumptuous, I think it's at the very least wishful thinking potentially. And I wanted to break this down because now we've seen the Jets, you know, they've been the kind of team that takes care of business against teams just below the playoff line. But I keep talking about what this team has looked like after Christmas. The reason I do that is because before Christmas, the Winnipeg Jets were clearly, I think it would be very hard for anyone to take a look at what the Winnipeg Jets have been and find a consistent stretch of hockey where the Jets are what they were before Christmas. That absolute wagon that went rolling through the month of December and left no doubt they were one of the best teams in the NHL. I use that point after Christmas because, I don't know, you, you can go find your fancy stats, go take a look at your eye test, and try and tell me a stretch of hockey in which this team has been that, that with that team we saw before. Now, one place, they have been great. And I've said this before and give credit where it's due because not every team does this. I don't think any team does this better in the NHL than the Winnipeg Jets do, but they bury the teams not just below the playoff line. Let's bear into the numbers a little bit more and, and take a look at what they do against the lower echelon teams. And yes, there's going to be some people who get really mad, who try and tell me every single team is the exact same team at the start of a game. And then somehow they end up being the Chicago Blackhawks or the Anaheim Ducks by the end of the game when that's the team they're playing. Like, I'm sorry, you if you don't like me pointing out that some teams are lower echelon teams, you're just going to have to get over it. But I'll say this, tissue, one of the guys, you want to stick around till the end of the podcast if you're here this some good news coming for you before it's all said and done. Um, but I break it down like this. Since Christmas time, the Jets have played 15 games against teams not just below the playoff line. Let's break it down into thirds of the league. The bottom third of the league, the bottom 11 teams in the league, the Jets have played 15 games against those teams. So schedule may have something to do with this here. 15 games against those teams. The Jets have gone 13-1-1, one, and one, a 900% point percentage in that stretch. It gets a little closer when you're playing the middle teams like the last two games that they played here. The, uh, excuse me, the New York Rangers and the New Jersey Devils are two teams that you find in the middle of the league and they're get, percentage against those teams. It's 571. They've gone eight and six against those teams. So definitely a better record, but 571 points percentage does not put them in one of the more heralded teams in the league, does it? 
Then we go to the teams that are in the top 11 is what I've got it broken down into. Top 11 teams in the league. The Jets have gone three, five, and one over that stretch. A three, eight, nine points percentage against those teams. Why does this matter? Why am I bringing up these numbers? Well, I can tell you right now, the reason I'm doing that is because those bottom third of the league teams that the Jets have feasted on 15 games since Christmas, they've got one game left against those kind of teams. The Ottawa Senators is the final game that they have against the teams that they have destroyed. They have feasted on. They have an astounding winning percentage, points percentage against, and if that's the points percentage that has kept them where they are in the, uh, in the hunt for first place in the Central Division. They can't rely on that. They had more games against bottom third teams since Christmas than any than the top third or the middle third. That is the group that they've been getting points on. That's the group they've been roasting, and that's not coming anymore because with 12 games left in the season, they've got one game left against those echelon of teams. They have six games left against middle echelon teams and five games left against upper echelon teams. You combine those winning percentages, what it tells us is that with 24 points left on the board based on their winning percentage against the middle frame teams, based on their winning percentage against the top frame teams, we should expect if things hold true down the stretch here, the Jets get 13 of their final 24 points. That's right. The Jets are just above a 500 hockey club when they're playing middle frame teams and upper echelon teams. This is what we should expect from them going forward. So this is why I bring up the idea that the New York Rangers game, we all took it as this is who the Winnipeg Jets are. Dan Robertson said it at the beginning of the podcast. I'm probably guilty of saying it on the last uh, broadcast there. You have to look at the possibility that that game is the outlier and the Winnipeg Jets have had trouble since Christmas time getting sustained success against the teams that matter most, the teams that they are going to be playing in the next stretch. And that if the Jets were to get 13 of their last uh, possible 24 points down the stretch here, it's not something people should be surprised about. It's something that we should completely and totally expect based on what they've shown us about who they are down the stretch of this season after Christmas time. That's my take on the whole thing. It's time to bring in the other man with the best music in the business to give us his take on the whole thing. Ladies and gentlemen, it is time to bring down the hammer. Oh, oh I that <sighs> set my hair on fire. That song uh, <laughs> behind the scenes, I'm like absolutely headbanging through that whole thing. Good to have you here. It's been too long, mm-hmm. Tammy. Um, probably for those folks out there that don't like the truth telling and don't Uh-oh. like a little bit of the Uh-oh. hammer being brought down, this is a poor game to bring on the hammer. I think mm-hmm. that this is the kind of game that it makes complete and total sense because at this stage, I think what we should be doing as analysts is trying to decipher patterns from what we're seeing from the Winnipeg Jets. I tried to give a little bit of numbers there to decipher some of those patterns. I don't know how much of it you heard, and maybe you're not mm-hmm. a numbers guy. A lot of people out there won't be numbers people, but I am basically drawing from what I'm seeing here, a team that if you're looking for consistency against the kind of teams they will have to play in the playoffs, and we know the Jets are going to the playoffs. We know that this is happening. Mm -hmm. But what I'm deducing here is that we are not seeing consistent hockey at all from this team against the kind of teams that are going to matter. Like I said, 27 of a possible 30 points they've taken against the bottom third of the league. And clearly... Anyone else is going to be, if you look at their numbers of the top teams, they're going to do better on average against the bottom third of the league, and it's going to get harder as you climb the ladder. So these numbers shouldn't necessarily be surprising. But the idea that the numbers tell us the Jets should expect to go just over 500 points percentage-wise down the stretch here, am I way off there? No, I think you're off on one thing about the consist- the lack of consistency. It's, it's the contrary. It has been consistent, consistently bad against good teams. And so it's not, to me, it's, look, we're, I was talking about this on a legal curve earlier today with the boys, and 
it's kind of wild to think about it, right? I mean, and you make the great point about kind of being a little bit in, you know, obviously benefiting from an easy schedule since Christmas, kind of stay afloat, right? But they're still battling, they're still battling for not just top spot in the central, top spot in the West. And yeah. so, you know, and this is a team that had a team that is in that situation despite being in the bottom third of both special teams. So it's just been their five on five play consistent consistently during that, you know, good stretch, of course. And, and of course their defensive play and yet they're still, you know, and yet they, that they've been so inconsistent down the stretch here against playoff bound teams that it's perplexing to really f- figure out what this team is about. I mean, this is a good team. There's no denying that. Like this is a, you know, this is a talented team when they play, the way we saw them play against New York, the way we've seen them play against Boston, you know, in the past this season, like when they show up for those games, you have these feelings like this could be, this could be 2018. This could be better than 2018. But then you look at games like this and, you know, you say all the right things after New Jersey, right? You say all the, you know, Brendan Dillon gets in front of the microphones and he spits fire and that's what he's known for. He's known for telling the truth. You have other guys echo a lot of the same sentiments of this wasn't good enough, special teams was bullshit, all these things. And then you just, you're waiting for a response. And and that response is, of course, this game. And it's against an Isles team that, yeah, is going to be prickly because of of, of their play of late, but they've been bullied for, you know, for a good stretch here. And then the Jets come in, they're supposed to be the team that's the contender. They're supposed to be the juggernaut in the equation. They're supposed to be the team that are supposed to put teams like the Islanders you know, to pasture, if you will, and it's the opposite. It's the opposite today. It's 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 the Jets allowing the Isles to look like juggernauts. It's the Jets making guys like Cal Clutterbuck look like the top echelon players in the league. It's 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 just no response. And you know, it it you know, I'm going to kind of flip over on the other foot for just a quick second. I don't know how much stock you want to put into these last two games. You know, whether or or this game in particular because this is a the fourth game of a five game road trip. We know that the Jets have played a lot of games here. So I don't know if you want to take, you know, if you want to take uh, greater meaning from it or not, but there is, it is problematic here. The good news is there's still, well, you know, it's just one game. There's still an opportunity to, to you know, <laughs> how, I, I guess salvage this road trip after looking like this team might go five and zero after the first two games, salvage it against, you know, a Washington team that will be much like the New York Islanders a team that's been scrappy a little bit here need to need need to wins to uh, to to get into the playoffs. So they're going to face a similar test. I think you know. Can we extend that? You know, can we extend that? We're about to see what this team's made of to this final game, and this is a this is the end of a back to back. So how, what are we expecting from the Winnipeg Jets? You know, to to show up tomorrow? Are they going to be a prickly team again? I think we're going to get a lot of answers tomorrow, even if we even if we did get some today. You know, I want to dive into this because I, I, I'm I wondering about this. Larry TSG says, is Sean saying the Jets are frauds? Um, I'm not using that moniker, but I do. Are you? That when that came out uh, and there was a player in that the Jets could potentially face and they said that comment about b- the Jets being frauds, I know, I know the people in our chat room, people in Jets world, probably in the organization, but definitely the fan base was was downright offended by that. How dare you? How dare you talk about our team like that? And boy, you are going to get a comeuppance. Um, Which would I, be the case for all 32 teams and fan bases in the league. That's a pretty well, bad insult. It's a pretty bad insult, but I guess I guess this is what I'm saying here. What does the Jets and their uh, again how they've responded? You know uh, the, the way that they'll go and they'll kind of you know they they sure beat up on they uh, like they beat up on the Ducks and they beat up on the Columbus Blue Jackets and then they went in and played a really really solid game against the Rangers. Then you kind of fall back like this. And before that, we were you know the talk was playing good one game against uh, you know uh, uh lo- below the playoff line teams then getting smoked by above the playoff line teams and so on and so forth i i guess my take on this is like i'm not going to go say this but let's examine it from this perspective here if you are that player out there who called the winnipeg jets frauds and if you are the people out there who heard that comment and outside of winnipeg heard that and said huh Winnipeg Jets frauds, eh? I don't know. That sounds pretty harsh. Let's take a closer look at that team. And what we've seen from this team since, 
is is there like I guess let's ask it like this. Since that comment has been made about the Winnipeg Jets, and I believe it happened right before that game that they were down three nothing against the Carolina Hurricanes, and then you know we're you know came back and scooped back and won that game. But have the Jets proven in any way? Could anyone make the argument? A Jets fan, a Jets player, someone in the Jets organization, can anyone outside outside? truly say that the Winnipeg Jets have done enough to shed that moniker that was shown on top of them that that a lot of people at the time thought was not deserving? Well, I don't think it's deserving either. So I'll start there. I don't think it's deserving because I don't, we don't know the answer yet. So, like, you know, someone can claim that they're fraud. Okay, hold on. I'm going to stop you right there. Not, okay. not we don't know the you're, answer you're not yet. Letting, you're are, not letting me are, answer your question, though. Like, that's just yeah, the I, I, I'm gonna I know what you asked me. I I'm going to make this quick question. distinction before that. It, okay. We don't know the answer yet. But in the past, the Winnipeg Jets, two seasons ago, started as the hottest team or the hottest start they'd ever had before, you, fell out of the playoffs where next I'm going. year. Yes, I'm just saying we don't know the answer to that yet, but the Winnipeg Jets to a degree have earned that moniker in the past. And are we like, so it's all, no. it's almost like you earned it. You need to shed it. Have they shed it? No, because no, obviously not. That's where, you know, that's what I was getting to is that, yes, I think there, because of your point, Sean, there, there have been, there has been evidence. There's been, there's been clear cut examples of the Jets last season. We're one of the best teams for the first half of the year, and then almost completed literally the most epic collapse in NHL history. That is that is quite the definition of being a fraud. You know, they would have been they would have been cemented automatic frauds had they somehow managed to miss out on the playoffs last season, but they got about as close as you possibly can get to full on fraud. So I understand that argument. Yes, the answer to this team, this team feels different. It looks different. The success has been different this year. It's been longer. It's been more sustained. It might be overshadowed by an easy schedule from you know since Christmas, which is absolutely the truth. But it's still a team that looks and feels different. So we don't know that answer. But to answer your question, absolutely they, you know, they 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 have not proven enough to shed that moniker because this team could very well do that. They could get bounced in the first round of the playoffs. There's a lot of, like, if you look at the standings right now, take the standings into consideration. How would you align the West as power rankings? It would be a much different power rankings right now. If you were to do it based on who's playing the best right at this moment, the whole West would be reconfigured in a lot of ways. Yeah. So, like, yeah, so we are about to find out what the Jets are made of. You know the, the the thing about like, like we we won't know this, but we like you know those kind of th those kind of monikers like that's a pretty aggressive thing. But I, I, we're about to find out, Sean, that, and and only time will tell. But absolutely, this team and this is where I think is going to be this team's biggest challenge. It's been their biggest challenge in the past. It's been the biggest challenge in recent years. Is dealing with success. You know, dealing with with winning, dealing with being the team who's supposed to be on the top and embracing it and bullying the teams below you. It's like the Jets have a, a challenge being the Kings. You know, they, they, they can't handle that success. And so we're going to figure out, you know, they haven't. And, and, and we've seen this, Sean, like you've seen it in the dressing room, you know, after kind of games where the Jets are feeling some pretty bloated about themselves, pretty good about certain wins and victories. This team realistically has not done a thing since 2018 it's 2024 now so the jets have a ton to prove but the good news is this is a really good looking team that you know when they when they play the way that we've seen them play for a majority of the season they're an exciting good looking team that fits that reputation as stanley cup contenders but until they do something make waves like no one's gonna no one's gonna give the jets any kind of a reward for being three quarters you know, seven eights through the season and, and being in a battle for first, let's see what they can do when it truly counts. And they're going to be, they're going to get the opportunity to re to write that story. So whether an anonymous player wants to call them a frauds, whether we want to debate where they are closer to Stanley cup contender or, or frauds, and we can use all the history we want, they have an opportunity to write their story here and it's up to them. We're about to find it out in the, probably the most exciting six to eight weeks uh, ahead of us here, Sean.
All right. Uh, hey, uh, good work by Ken Weeb, who I wasn't expecting until like another 25 minutes from now. He's made it here uh, and he's been listening to some of this. So he's going to be able to retort to what is said here. So why don't we uh, quit waiting and bring in the other man with the best music in the business? Here comes Kenny. Because none of us are dressed like Vittorio men, I'm going to take this opportunity and say, if you need something that looks good in your life, because that Jets game looked anything but, uh, it's time to head on down to Corden Avenue, walk into Vittorio Rossi, loudly proclaim that Kenny and Rennie sent you, uh, ask for Frankie and the boys, and they will do you up, right? They'll have you looking good far better. Well, maybe as good as the New York Islanders look tonight or the Winnipeg Jets made them look. I'd also like to give the I'm going to give the pristine roofing wake up call. I don't want to be going back and forth, giving it to the Jets. They woke up. They didn't wake up, blah, blah. I'm just going to give it to Ken Weeb, who woke up and got through traffic far quicker than I thought was possible <laughs> from him. So great job as Kenny got the pristine roofing wake up call. Uh, of course, North End Rick is the guy you call to get the pristine roofing wake up call. 204-981-6289 for any of your roof and siding needs. You can also call Pristine Roofing at 1-204-237-7663. Remember their Pay It Forward program that they are going with right now. If you know someone in your life who needs a new roof, uh, no matter the circumstances, get a hold of Pristine Roofing. Plead your case to them because someone is getting a free roof coming up by the generosity of Pristine Roofing. Great job by them. Ken, it is great to see you. Uh, let's get a breakdown of what you saw in that game. Yeah, great to be with the fellas. Uh... Happy Saturday. Hope all is well there. Um, uh, probably for me, this is the worst Jet Jets game of the season, I would say. Uh, I would say it was their poorest effort. Um, the you know. Uh oh, stop, Kenny. You're going to make BA split really upset now. You know, like, this is, uh, he was expecting <laughs> yeah. you to come. Worst he effort of the he season. Was Sorry. He was expecting and, you and to come in and make it all okay. Yeah, well, I, 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 he thought your analysis they, uh, would be as sweet as yeah. the uh, as the uh, banana split. Uh oh. Yeah, not. I'm going to uh -oh. make it okay, uh -oh. but uh, don't break uh -oh. his heart. No, no. It's again. This is this is this is Thanksgiving special Minnesota Wild. The only thing missing was the turkey and the leek and gravy for the Jets. Uh, yeah, I mean, third period, fine. They pushed back a little bit. Good for them. Um, but uh, uh -oh. just on the topic of what you guys were talking about, I mean, we're, Jets are only going to... I'm with Hammer here all the way, and I don't even know why we're giving this, uh, you know, all the player... This player that said this to the Spitting Chicklets guy must be laughing because he's got everybody talking about it for the last two months when all it really matters is how the Jets are going to be playing in April and May, if they happen to get to May or beyond or whatever it ends up being. Um, yeah, they've been a good team, but are they going to be the differentiator between being a good team and a great team? That is what the playoffs are for. That's what they're all about. And um, we're not going to, we're going to rate the Jets season on how they played against the New Jersey Devils or the New York Islanders. You can't dismiss it or ignore it. This was a, this was a horrible effort. They were sleeping out of the gate uh, first goal is absolutely terrible. You you can't win a face-off in the defensive zone and somehow give up a goal. It's I understand there's a bad element of a bad bounce in there, but come on. Anyone who's been in a face-off, your responsibility as the right-handed defenseman is the front of the net. So, yes, bad bounce for, ne for Neil Pionk that the puck went off of Vlad Nemestikov's skate and that he couldn't handle it. No problem. If you can't get the puck, you got to take Cal Clutterbuck there. He got, he didn't get the puck, and as he was fishing for it, he missed oh the man. The man blew by him, and not only did the man blow by him, he blew by him for not one but two chances. So, again, that that's that's not emblematic of how the Jets have played five on five. And I'm not laying the blame on Neil Pionk in a game where the Jets were a little bit sleepy out of the gate. It was a tough game for Neil Pionk. There's no way around that. He's had a good bounce back season, and. We don't like to talk about minus plus minus very often, but 
dash four. It was a it it, it was this time it was not uh, an, an in, a bad reflection of what happened. It was an accurate reflection of what happened in the game. Out muscled on a couple of plays, uh, completely lost coverage on the other goal uh, for by Anders Lee. Now, again, that's not how Neil Pionk has played for the most part this year. And people saying, oh, he's been terrible all year. Those people need the pristine roofing wake-up call. He's had a pretty solid year overall. But there were too many mistakes today by Neil Pionk and by plenty of players wearing Jets jerseys. That's why I said I thought it was the worst effort of the year. The score was flattering. But you can't go crazy about this. The Jets had not lost back-to-back yet. And I don't care about the level of competition, though I do understand it may have played a role. They hadn't lost back-to-back games since the All-Star break. So let's not pretend the Jets have been awful for this stretch of games. They need to be better down the stretch. And guess what? Sean, Jeff, if the Jets play this way this week coming up against Edmonton, Vegas, against uh, uh, LA during the break, and then on that last trip, if they look like this against Colorado and Dallas, and then in the last game against Vancouver, then there's a problem for the Winnipeg Jets. And if that if that problem will lead to an early exit, if they can't get this sorted out, um, yeah, I mean, I don't think they've been great the last while, but they've been okay. Now, they need to raise their level of play. This is very simple. If they want to they want to have a 2018 Magic Carpet Ride, they need to lock in here during the last, now it's 12 games, and if it's not 12 games, it's got to be the last seven or eight, Sean, because we've talked about this before. That eight-game losing skid at the end of the Canadian, uh, or seven or eight, whatever it ended up being in the Canadian division, it was ind- indicative of what was to come. Yes, they pulled three rabbits out of the hat in overtime against the Oilers and swept them, but that was it, right? So you can't ignore what's happening down the stretch, but I mean, let's see what happens here. The Jets will have ample opportunity to show themselves against really good teams. They're playing. Sean, you laid out the entire schedule. So the Jets will play plenty of those good teams and high-end teams during the stretch. And even then, they got to be ready for April 20th, but they better not be coasting into April 20th or else it's going to be a short spring in Winnipeg. Um, I just wanted to counter to what you're saying there and take a look at the, I mean, if we go back to 2019 and we go and we start with the Blues and then we go after that, aren't the vast majority of teams, including Vegas last year, aren't aren't the vast majority of teams that go on to win the Stanley Cup teams that are completely and totally taking care of business down the stretch here? Like it's 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 all fine to say. And listen, there's a whole bunch of people who are cranking up the excuse machine here uh, down the stretch uh, and saying, oh, well, it's not a big deal. Uh, uh, You know, the the Jets, Jets just uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, As far as I could tell, it wasn't game seven of the Stanley Cup finals here today. But isn't there ample evidence that shows that what the Jets are doing right now does not translate to success and there should be reason? Hey, We can always say, oh, there's always tomorrow until they lose and there's no tomorrow. But isn't our job supposed to be to take a look at this and see where this leaves them heading into the playoffs? And how is it possible we could take a look at this based on what the Vegas Golden Knights did last year last year and what the Colorado Avalanche did the years before that and the two years before that what the Tampa Bay Lightning did and what the St. Louis Blues did in 2019. Isn't there ample evidence that the Jets are not following the pattern of success of the teams that have the most success heading into the playoffs right now. Sure. They've had some hiccups. I'm I'm not disputing that. I actually said that, but they have time to play well against great teams. If they play poorly in those games, then yes, be as concerned as you would like. The jets are two points out of first place. So to me, they're fine. Do I, are they blowing away the competition? Absolutely not. But I mean, Vegas just lost nine of 11. Are you ready to say Vegas is not doesn't have? Timmy, you kind of sound like that dog sitting in a chair with all the flames around, saying it's fine. <laughs> and I'm not like it I don't is think, fine I don't for think either of us are denying where the Jets are in the standings. And if and if you know if anyone would have wanted to rewind on this YouTube video and go back to my original monologue, right. if you will, at the start, I said exactly what you're saying. They're not in trouble because of all the things they haven't had this season, a lack of special teams, all these, you know, a dip in scoring for a while, their they're inconsistent play, they're still first place. But you can't ignore the fact that, like, it's good. we're going to be saying it's fine, it's, you know, whatever, if in five games from now, and there's only going to be six games left. So it's not about panicking or about, you know, being overly worried about it. It's about looking at the real picture here and wondering if the Winnipeg Jets belong in the same tier 
as the Colorado Avalanches, the Dallas Stars, the teams that, yes, they're in the standings with, but they're not playing to the same degree. Oh, they're not playing near... Are the Jets playing like December? No, we've been saying that for the last two months, and I'm with you on that. If the Jets don't play like they did in December, they're not winning two rounds or three rounds or four rounds. They might not even win one round. I'm I'm totally fine with that. I just don't think it... I just don't see the value in saying the Jets are... Like, I know no one's exactly saying this, but you're just you're doing that thing where you say that people are saying something to the extreme, but we're not saying that you're doing that thing where it's like, are are we ready to say that? Well, no, you're saying the Jets are showing us what they are. And that that's we don't know that that will come in April 20th and beyond. Here, Let's let's look at it like this. Larry TSG says, have the Jets given you any reason to believe they'll just flick the switch in these next few games? I guess I would say it like this, Ken. If you're going to take that tax and it's like, are, are we saying that the Jets are blown up and they're not going to get here? No. And then go to the exact oh, no, opposite it, end man. and what say, is, what is and, hold on, just let me finish here, Jeff. Or, 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 or go to the other end and say, well, is there time for them to right the ship? Yes. Like, it can't always be doom like the the worst possible thing versus the saying. best possible thing and you're in the middle you can't that you can't jump on that analysis let's say it like this you're basically saying that people out there should be like that there's reason to hope and you can't define what they're saying so i guess i'm saying this the 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 rangers game great example of it but go down the stretch over the last number of months here and point to the times that the winnipeg jets have shown you that they're in a position to go and make a deep run what are the games what I'm give saying is it requires context. All teams have had bad well, give losses us in the last month. Give us the context. Give us, yeah, you can't do that. You can't say other teams have been bad, so it's okay to be bad. Give us the context of what the Jets, like, let's break it down. Let's analyze. Sure. What have the Jets shown you? Give me examples of what they have shown you over the last two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, since Christmas, whatever you want that says they're right there and everyone should expect that they will flip the switch and that they are ready ready to go on a long playoff run. Well, I mean, we've been talking about the examples the whole time. So Uh, give us an example. They're still one of the best, if not the best team in five on five. Their special teams let them down this week. They were horrible against the, the New Jersey Devils. Three goals against. Today, they were horrible defensively. Gave up goals off the rush. Gave up goals with terrible coverage. Gave up goals off face off plays. Are there signs of cracks in the foundation? Yes. I'm with you there. No question about it. What I'm not saying is that every game is a referendum. What I'm saying is that I want to see <laughs> them not, against we're Dallas. We're not saying that. We're very specifically hey, we're, asking we're you to show us the game that thing. make we're you all, think. We're, not, we're arguing the same point, Kane. What we're talking about is that you go, you come on, you you reiterate everything we said about the negative. So I'm with you. Exactly. But then you come in, then you go, but it's like, but we can't panic. No one's panicking. We're just acknowledging what we see in front of our faces. A well, I'm acknowledging it too. Exactly. That's why I don't know what we're debating here. I, I guess Sean's just trying to get you to say the Jets aren't playing that well. I <laughs> did no, I'm, say not trying, I'm not trying to get him to say that. I'm saying like you're you're making it sound like the idea of anyone being concerned well, no. about the Jets is ridiculous. Uh, that's, that's not what, what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is ridiculous to say it's 2019. So what I'm is show us what is happening here. And B.A. Split, who is just loving in you in absolutely New here and thinking that you're coming to bat here and making these points, is trying to say no one in the league is playing good right now. When I'm taking a look in the Colorado Avalanche, or 9-1-0 and in their last 10, the Carolina Hurricanes, okay. 8-1-1, and the Dallas Stars, 8-2-0, and the Edmonton Very good. 7-1 and 2. The Toronto Maple Leafs even 6-3 and 1. The Nashville Predators, oh, you know, and two, so on and so forth. It. So like this idea <laughs> that it's like it. it's it's the like that everyone is just taking it off and coasting. I'm saying it. I don't I, know I how didn't I, say I, I that. say it again. I, you're not saying it. I'm talking, I'm answering BA split who's talking about this here. But I guess I'm asking you very specifically. No problem. To tell me Ask the again. times, like I said, over the last two, three, four weeks, what are the games? I got, I get you. You can take a look at that Rangers game and we can all believe there you go. That's how they have to play. They're capable of playing. The, they're going on to the Stanley cup. They're going two or three rounds, but they're not showing that they can do that consistently. So outside of saying that there's 12 games left and they can figure it out. Anyone can say that. Tell us what they're, the, tell us, give B a split here. Who is like dying for you to give him a reason why the sky isn't falling and everything is okay. Give him a reason based on <laughs> examples of what we've seen. No Over problem. The, last the reason I've already said it, they have not lost consecutive games till today since January. That's almost two months of hockey. That's that's some level of consistency. Is it the level they showed in December? No, I'm with both of you on that. 
but it doesn't mean that the what we've been talking about all this this is my biggest problem of course we're going to re- reference 2018 and 19 because those years the jets were like this near the top of the standings throughout the course of the year one year they went on a run one year they faded down the stretch when dustin bufflin and josh morrissey were not in the lineup for the last 20 games of the year so yes there are some issues to sort out But we've spent all year talking about how the Jets have flipped over their roster, playing a totally different committed style. And now suddenly we're going to be saying that the Jets have no chance. That that's that doesn't that doesn't work for me. It doesn't make sense to me. You just nailed our exact point. No one said Jets have no chance. It's just the Jets haven't been playing the way that their record is indicated. and And that's what I'm saying. Like, I think the point is. You know, again, you didn't put. I don't think you put Bardo. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. I don't know if you put his comment, but we're arguing the same thing. I just think it's. I think we're what we're. I guess what we're. I guess what we're debating here is what we see right now. Like how much confidence should you have in the Winnipeg Jets right now, given what we've seen? And of course, contextually, you have to take the whole season into consideration. We've been saying this. This has been a team who survived bad special teams and is still battling. There's all those positive things that are happening, but. It's difficult. It's difficult to play this, you know, to compete in the playoffs. They might be up against a Dallas or a Colorado in the first round. And right. I think I think where we're all agreeing here is that you're right. There's 12 games remaining, but the runway is getting shorter and shorter. Agreed. And we need to start figuring this out sooner than later. And that's absolutely I think that's where we're all at here. I don't we're think, all there. You know, my, my, I think it's a it's a confusion to say, you know, you're too much on this good side and me and Sean are dumping on no, no, no. I think the reality is, is that we're looking at a team that has the potential to be a Stanley Cup contender, but isn't living up to it right now. And unless we start seeing some more consistency in those games, I don't know if you have that confidence going in, but anything can happen in the spring. We know that. Sure. Now my, my, my only thing is too, like Sean, we've been talking about Colorado all year. Like a month ago, we said Colorado is not a concern to the Jets. Now they're a concern. Well, so in the next trade, month, the we're going to find out. happens in between there. And again, like I don't like the Casey Middlestad trade because I think they gave up too much to get it. But what they did before this, before that, the conversation we had was I said, unless they pick up a second line center and add some depth, it's not going to help. They did right. add quite a bit of depth. And so they're responding really good after it. Now, I still think, and maybe I'm an, an idiot for saying this, because, and maybe I just fell too much into what I saw. Don't from say them that ahead You're not of time. An idiot. But the like, I watched their game last night where they beat the Columbus Blue Jackets six one. Their goaltending still concerns me. So I I honestly do think the best case scenario for the Jets in the first round would to would be to fall to second or third and play the Colorado Avalanche in that spot because the way they're playing right now it doesn't stack up well against Nashville, and I don't think they've stacked up well all year. Whoever's against the Dallas bigger. Stars. But that said, the the one thing that the Colorado Avalanche did, maybe they didn't do it to the degree that I would have thought as a Colorado Avalanche fan, you want them to do it, but they did go and take and plug a whole bunch of the holes that they had in their lineup, which makes them a different team clearly as they're going down the stretch here. Um, but yeah, that, I've made my point. Anyways, I want to move on to this idea of uh, Jeff had made a, a comment before about the Jets not being able to handle success. Um, I want to get into that. But first, I want you to give Sweet Lou a shout out. Yeah, right on. For folks who have realty needs they'd like to have met, whether you're buying, selling, or curious about what the house on the corner is looking for, contact our main man, Lou Ferlin at Royal Page Namic Realty. Tell him Kenny and Renny sent you. 204-791-9971 or at the office, 204-989-5000. His email is lou at louferlin.ca. That's L-O-U at L-O-U-F-U-R-L-A-N.ca. Lou Ferlin, excellent realtor, excellent human being, and excellent supporter of the community, including this podcast, for which we are grateful. And I'm just going to say, if you like fire in your podcasts, uh, it really paid <laughs> off bringing Hammer onto the show here today. And if you're looking mm. to pay off high interest credit cards or debt, we suggest you go talk to our friends at Cambridge Credit Union about their payoff loan. They can show you how taking out a loan to pay off your debt actually gets you debt free faster. And you can save thousands of dollars. Go to cambrian.mb.ca to book an appointment online. Okay. Jeff said before this, Jeff, do you need to clarify or yes. is there something specifically well, you, you want yeah, to talk no, about when I, you can't handle success? What I said, it was part of the context of talking about whether or not, you know, the fraud conversation. And obviously I disagreed with that title for this year. I just said, as part of that argument, some of the issues that this team, one of the bigger issues that this team has had in the past, not necessarily this season, because look where they are in the standings this late into the year. 
but they've dealt, they've had a hard time dealing with success. And, you know, they are going to be put to the test here over this next 12 games because they're in a fight for first. They're expected to win games. And the schedule and got so, harder. And the schedule is getting harder. So that's that, you know, we're going to see this is, you know, we don't have an answer yet, but we are going to see how they handle what will be, you know, arguably the most challenging part of their schedule as they get into the playoffs, looking to find that, you know, secure that unbelievable first spot in cent central division and what it means for their, you know, their Stanley cup aspirations. So we're going to see them in the fight and we're going to see how they handle, you know, the success that they've had to this point. Ken, what do you no, think? I think he's got it covered there. Yeah. I mean, I, I, yes, this is what I said at the beginning. Like we'll have plenty of time to see if the jets can, will crank it up. I'd still think 12, 12 games is ample time for them to get rolling. Uh, they'll have a five game homestand coming up and then they have four very difficult games on the road, all of which might matter depending on how Minnesota fares over the next little bit of time here. So um, yeah, you're going to have to measure up against high quality teams or the jets will be out. That applies to Dallas and Colorado and Vancouver and Edmonton and Vegas. Also, I mean, it, it applies to everybody. There's a lot of great races happening. I can't wait for the races. Sorry, before we get into the other stuff, who would you start tomorrow? And do you think that the conversation, I know Scott O'Neill didn't say after the game if it changed their or altered their goaltending plans. Who are you starting in the pipes tomorrow against Washington if you're Scott O'Neill and Wade Flaherty? Go, Jeff. I'm giving, I'm probably starting Laurent Persois. It's his start. That was, you know, like, unless you want to use the argument that if Connor Hellebuck really wants it, like, yeah, no, to me, I, I don't care if, Connor Halbuck really wants it. I would say if, 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 you know, I, I think that's his scheduled start. He had to come in and for in, in relief. I think the the timing of the pull allows for Connor Halbuck to maybe start the, the next game. And if that's what the decision, the team's going to make for the betterment of the team, I'm not going to disagree with it. I just think in the principle of things, because of how good Laurent Persois has played this season, I don't think that it would be fair. That's all what I would say, but Life isn't fair. Professional sports certainly isn't fair. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if Hellebuck was, but I would, I would, you know, I think I would go with my regular, regular scheduled goaltend. Uh, I like this comment by T. Konopoli. You start LB and you get a B in Helly's and the team's bonnet. Uh, I, I like at least the Jets response after he goes into the net. Uh, Ken, I think it was, no, it yep. wasn't you I was talking with. Uh, someone else had got a hold of me after the fourth goal and said he thought that they should have pulled the Helly. I agreed at that point just because I thought, you know, uh, um, you want to see because the, the team has usually responded well when LB has been in net. You're looking for a spark at that stage stage and the amount of shots that they had uh, at that point was just unacceptable they needed a spark I mean and, and listen I said this before I don't take a look at this game and I don't think that Connor Hellebuck played a bad game I think the team played terribly around yeah. him like I said uh, um, uh, noodles on the broadcast had suggested that Connor Hellebuck it wasn't a very good goal the second one I don't blame him for it I don't really blame him for a lot of what happened in this game here tonight but this is the reason you make these kind of moves you 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 try try and spark something. And Lauren Brassois allows one goal after that. But from that point on for the rest of the game, Lauren Brassois uh, steadies that team, calms them down. The Jets start playing a different style of game. Part of the strategy of moving goalies in and moving goalies out is trying to get an effect from your team, not just from those goalies. And the fact of the matter is that I've said it once, I've said it a hundred times, there's no difference in this team whether Connor Hellebuck is in net or whether Lauren Brassois is in net, which gives you a wide open playing field to play goalies and switch things around to try and get a response from your team. I've said this before about the way, or I was saying this to someone behind the scenes about the way this team handles their situation. They've been pulling guys in and out of the lineup to try and get a response from this team. Okay. But when you're pulling your 12th forward and your sixth defenseman, and you're playing this game that essentially only creates competition between five guys, I think after a while, it just doesn't have the effect you're hoping it has anymore. Okay. We put the, you know, we flipped out David Gustafson for Cole Perfetti. Now the entire team is going to stand up and be like, we better get serious guys. That doesn't work anymore because let's be honest with ourselves, 11 forwards and five defensemen, or maybe four defensemen we've seen in the past a little bit are unaffected by these you think changes. Have it ever had that effect though? 
by taking you know, by I, I swapping think out the beginning fourth and the bottom six, you think it affected? You think it had a ripple effect to the rest of the lineup? I think that's I just think I quo think there was I, no. I think for because a while you're allowing guys to come in and get opportunity as well. No, I think for a while there it was a sign to the team that it was like we're not just going to sit back and be okay. We're going to make changes, right? And so at the beginning when they started kind of taking that tact, I think it had an effect on the team. Now I think it's just like I said, it's five guys whose whose playing time is being messed with, and everyone else, no matter what happens, is going to be in the lineup. So I don't think it has that effect anymore. So I think that you can create that by moving the goalies back and forth. Uh, I've been saying this, and, and here's the other thing to look about the the pattern that we've mostly witnessed from Connor Hellebuck throughout his career is super super hot starts tails off a little bit towards the playoffs and I contend Ken and I always disagree on this but playoff Connor Hellebuck is a myth it is the one thing missing on his resume that would put him alongside the Carey Prices of his generation the Vasilevskis of his generation those players have a thick book of playoff exploits where they have gone out and affected series in massive, massive ways that Connor Hellebuck does not have. There's been conversations about this. Rick Bonus has talked throughout this year about the idea of trying to limit the amount of work that Connor Hellebuck has to face before he heads into the playoffs to keep him fresher. The idea of that was playing better five-on-five hockey, allowing less shots, allowing the shots that were allowed to be from, from distance so they're not that challenging. But what we're seeing here is you cannot deny Connor Hellebuck's numbers as the season has gone on are not what they were at the beginning beginning of the season. He's still, in my opinion, the walkaway winner of the Vesna Trophy this season. But if you're the Jets and we're being serious about what they need to do to get towards the playoffs here, this may be a scenario where you want to light a fire under his butt or give him a little bit of rest or whatever is happening down the stretch here. I know it's tough because they're in the middle of a fight for first place, but there is no doubt in my mind that Lauren Brassois has shown at every stage that the Jets should not be shying away from moving or using him in more situations because he does not provide a drop off. He's right there. So you can make those plays. So either if you want to light a fire under Connor Hellebuck, you can do it. If you want to give him rest, you can do it. But history tells us, I, I still do think uh, Lauren Rousseau gets that start, but history tells us the Winnipeg Jets will not didn't happen under Paul Maurice, hasn't happened uh, under under Rick Bonus. They will not make changes that would look like they were trying to spur Connor Hellebuck. That is just not how they respond to this. It's It's got to be something to do with his psychology and what they expect from him. I don't think they like challenging him in that way, so I wouldn't expect that to happen going forward. I would ex- I would start Brassois also, and, and not to start a fire, but just because don't deviate from your plan. You went out of your way to get him a second start on this road trip. Give him the start. He's been playing well enough. The only thing for Hellebuck is that it'd be easy to say today, you know, good good chance for him to get back in the lab with Wade Flaherty. Well, the problem with that is Jets play in the morning, then they have Monday off, then they play Edmonton. So it, he's going to have to sit and stew on it for a while, but that's fine. You want Connor Hellebuck to be ready to go against Connor McDavid and the Edmonton Oilers. Play Brassois on Sunday, play Hellebuck Tuesday, and then see how it goes. Brassois has deserved the starts. I think he should play Sunday also. That's why I brought it up. Okay, let's move to the uh, Johnson Group Got You Covered play of the game. Uh, Here, you either you have anything? You have it. You have it. You sent it to me. Um, you have it. Morgan Barron. Jeff, back you check. have one? Yeah, so right. Uh, uh, hey, I do believe when blowouts happen, there's a big difference between six goals and seven goals, only because of the psychology of football and the idea that getting seven points scored on you is a touchdown. It's always like a little bit of a whenever I see seven plus goals, for some reason in my mind, there's a big difference between six and seven. And Morgan Barron goes down and breaks up basically uh, what was almost a two on O if he doesn't have hustle back and get up into the play down the stretch there that ends up making sure that the Jets don't give up uh, uh, a converted touchdown in that game. Uh, not a lot of others to look at in that game, but my, Morgan Barron has my Johnson Group got you covered play of the game. Anything for you guys? I got one. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I got Dylan Sandberg has got you covered. In a 6-3 loss, he was a plus two. Wow. Um, Impressive. Five seconds short of 20 minutes ice time or 26 shifts. You know, for 
all things considered, that's uh, not too bad. And I think it's evident that the uh, that Nate Schmidt also finishing a plus one. That third pairing was 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 probably the best best pairing in the uh, in the game when you look, especially when you look at Neil Pionk and and uh, and Brendan Dillon, both a minus four, and and Morrissey and Demello or Morrissey minus one, Demello zero. I know people are going to attack me for plus minus. And it's and it's uh, and how inconsequential it is, but certainly Dylan Sandberg no. deserves a nod for for all things considered in that trash game for the Jets. Good yep, pull, right on. Um, the, that's the Kenny and Rennie Johnson OGs. The Johnson Group uh, got you covered. Play of the game, and hey, do you run a small business in Canada? Look to Canada's number one employee benefits plan, Chambers Plan, to give you a competitive edge. Chambers Plan is the simple, stable, smart choice for over thirty thousand businesses countrywide. Visit ChamberPlan.ca to learn more. All right, uh, do we have ourselves a keg save of the game, Hammy? I'll start with you since you uh, put on the Johnson Group. Let's see if you can keep it going here. Momentum, momentum. Um, <laughs> I don't even know if I wrote one down. I did want to say this, so I will take my opportunity because when we went into you gave Kenny a chance to break down his thoughts in the game and you and me just went to broader issues, you know. Yeah. So we never even talked yes. about it. So I do want I want to do take my time to say I was gonna say, holy I thought the Jets had the first momentum swing, and then by the 10 minute mark, I was like, What the clutterbuck happened? Anyways. <laughs> um but savor the game. I don't have. Oh, oh! I have big save on Horvat in 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 tight late in the in the there first you go. period. There you go. Huh? There you go. That, we doing that's like, good enough. Yeah, good, good enough. enough. The shots were twenty one to four at that point. When the shots were when the shots were twenty one to four at that point, we're gonna we're gonna give it to Hellebuck for the overworked uh, action. Uh, good good find right there. Yeah, I, you know what I'll say is uh, on that goal, um, the fifth goal of the game scored, which is just basically the Jets getting outworked in front of the net. Connor Hellebuck stopped a bunch of those shots in tight, basically, you know, gave the Jets every opportunity in that moment to clear clear the crease um, and keep it from happening. So I'll give that sequence right before he allows the goal to Connor Hellebuck for at least yep. giving the chance, uh, the Jets a chance to clear the front of the net. Uh, and that's my hashtag the keg save of the game doesn't matter what we think though matters what you think share with us your hashtag the keg save of the game you're automatically entered to win a 50 dollars gift certificate usable at any of the three fine keg locations here in the city of winnipeg and the winner from last podcast that would be mick loggerton mick loggerton oh. i believe mick loggerton's comment came in the youtube uh comments afterwards so mick loggerton uh maybe that means you're not a in the moment watcher hopefully you didn't get scared away i'll say this afternoon game though afternoon eight, game though right but there's 888 people in here right now a lot of people get scared okay. off by losses so to all you brave souls who showed up congratulations uh mick loggerton if you're not hearing it now hopefully you'll hear it later Later. Uh, if you do, you got to direct message me at SN Sean Reynolds. Give me your full name and give me your email, and I will have the keg send you a $50 gift certificate usable at any of their three fine keg locations here in the city of Winnipeg. Each location finer than the last. And that brings us to the hashtag TCB lamplighter of the game. We'll start with you, Ken. What do you got? I mean, the Islanders' goals were pretty. I love the bar down by Clutterbuck, but uh, for a guy who's gone through an awful lot mentally in the last. Uh, couple of months i'm going to give the nod to cole perfetti uh he has been struggling we know that the first 40 games he was excellent 29 points two assists since got his first goal in 24 um he's been he's a guy who's very hard on himself and has been going through a hard time but uh as someone who's a little familiar with the healthy scratch uh i, I gotta give him the nod on this one what do you got jeff i actually i'm gonna i'm gonna give one for each i i just gotta give credit to clutterbuck's second goal just him stepping, him stepping over, you know, he looked like he was, he did his best Nathan, Nathan uh, McKinnon impression for a guy who had five goals heading into this game <laughs> to pick up his sixth and then wire his seventh over, you know, pretty much the hole between his, his shoulder and his neck. Um, I thought that was an impressive goal, but Vladdy Nemestikov, man, I, I was, I was waiting for him to, to uh, drop the puck to his skate, kick it back up to his forehand and, and, and finish off the Pavel Bure there. I, yeah. I was, I was getting ready for it, but he, he did arguably an even nicer move. So I, I'm moving over to uh, Nemestikov for that, um, that highlight real goal. That was, that was speed, everything, speed and finish. I loved it. Also, also great play by Barron to provide yeah. the chip that allowed him to sneak behind the defense. And even Josh Morrissey doesn't get an assist, Sean, but, 
he starts that play in the D zone, getting it to DeMello. DeMello with a really smart heads up play and uh, the chip by Barron is, uh, is high end there as well. And great finish by Nemestikov. Um, I'm going to do this. I want to come back to that goal though. I'm going to hand out, uh, because it's something I wanted to talk about quickly before we get out. We'll have to handle it after the, we hand out the lamp later, but I'm going to give it to Matthew, Matthew Barzell for the fifth oh, yeah. uh, goal of the game. The reason I do is because at that moment, it just showed that, you know, they're up four one and the Islanders are coming with like the kind of effort that is going to, like you talk about repeatable goals. Those are repeatable goals. When you just simply outwork the other team, get to the front of their net, um, the, the, the fact that Connor Hellebuck is so hard to beat in tight, the way that he just kind of chips it through him, finds a hole through him in that situation. To me, that's just like a goal scorer's touch. Matthew Barzell. All will. Um, if we think about, uh, yeah, all will. Uh, and, and I think we've said this about Matthew Barzell. Walked into the league as a point-per-game player as a 20-year-old and under Barry Trotz was kind of broken back down uh, and built back up as a defensive player. We saw how good he was during those two Stanley Cup runs by the um, Tampa Bay Lightning, where the New York Islanders took them to the wall, and Matthew Barzell showing he was a playoff player. I know they haven't figured things out, and maybe you can point to him as a guy with the New York Islanders, but Hey, you know, who, who as they've tailed off, maybe you point the finger at him. I just think Matthew Barzell is a really complete player that if, uh, uh, I remember my buddy had talked about, you know, a big, big swing to trade for him to bring him to the Jets. I think if you brought him to a team like the Jets, what he would be capable of, I think would be surprising. Me seeing him, a guy with that much skill, that pass that he makes, the Hudson fashing for the fourth goal of the game, uh, uh, and then that goal he's able to get. He flashed his skill, flashed his grit. Uh, this is the kind of guy that when they get into the playoffs is is the complete player. Uh, you will appreciate Matthew Bar Zell, whenever the next best on best tournament is, that would uh, involve him in Canada because he's the kind of player you're going to be really happy to have on Team Canada. That's my TCB lamp player of the game. Doesn't matter what these guys think or what I think, though. Uh, matters what you think. Share with us your hashtag lamp later of the game. You're automatically entered to win a frosty, delicious eight pack of lamp lighter ale brought to you by our friends at Trans Canada Brewing Company. If you cannot wait for Kenny and Rennie, and in this case, Hammer, to gift you uh, your very own eight pack, you can head on down to Trans Canada Brewing Company where they've got plenty of those eight packs down there at 11290 Keniston. Join them in their tap room. You can go to their beer store. You can go get it on tap. You can get great pizza, great food under a great atmosphere, which you will know and find out if you are joining us at the April 6th version, the final K&R, Kenny and Rennie live podcast we will be hosting there. Sold out already. Thank you to everyone who bought those tickets. Uh, if anyone wants a chance at a, another Kenny and Rennie event, there will be the big one, the year ender where we send her. Uh, we'll keep you posted on when that's going to happen. It's all dependent on how the Jets do in the playoffs this year, but uh, uh, thank you for all that. Time to announce our winner of the TCB lamp later of the game from last show. And that would be Tishu. Tishu. Uh, oh, you you are on the clock. Uh, direct message me at SN Sean Rounds. I didn't see him in the chat room here today. Uh, he usually chips in. So my guess is he's not here today. Hopefully he listens to it afterwards or he's going to miss out on a frosty, delicious eight pack that he can claim by direct messaging me at SN Sean Reynolds, giving me his full name and also uh, and H Hammer, you uh, know that you're always invited to these things as Steph. I think we guys. even talk. Kenny's on the road that. that yeah, you're there, buddy. You're there. Yeah, talked about me in. being there, so I think yeah, I think I've committed to that. So I. Think Anyways, um, the, uh, I would ask you uh, so direct funny. message me, Tishu, and give me your full name and give me your, your email address, and I will send you a voucher for a frosty delicious eight pack of lamplight or amber ale. Brought to you by our friends at TCB. It's the absolute nectar of the gods. What was that, Hammy? I was just gonna say, I, if you're wearing your fitness watch, you probably have registered a small workout. During the shot, and and yet and yet you're 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 still wearing your bees cap. Keeping you on task is a job all in itself, Hammy. No, 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 uh, no, no head time, time. No but head I down. like it. It's worth it. It's worth it. Uh, you guys can go OT, but I got a bouncer. No, we're not going to go OT. Okay. Uh, we'll just shut it down. We're already in OT. I was going to talk on something. We can go there after that. Uh, hey, um, chat room, once again, on fire. Appreciate it. Sorry, you wanted to mention that goal. You. you wanted to go back to Don't it. Don't worry about it. We'll go. Uh, if, if it's No, do it now. Added, I got a few minutes. No, 
If it stays a pattern, we'll go to it at another time. Uh, I'm not going to get into it now. Uh, great job, chat room. You rocked it as always. Hammy, it's always a pleasure to have you. Hopefully, we'll see you on April 6th. You're invited if you want to come. Ken, thank you for hustling and getting in earlier than I thought you were going to. You didn't give me much time to bash you behind the scenes, so uh, I'll have to wait for next time. Yeah, work a little uh, harder until... T- you- hey, just like the Jets were saying after the game, the best news about this show in this league, you'll have another chance tomorrow to get the exactly. bashing in. No doubt. Uh, one uh, one entity or the entities you should not bash uh, if you appreciate the conversations happening in this space is our sponsors who fight to keep the conversation going in this space. For us, that's Vittorio Rossi, Cambier and Credit Union, Pristine Roofing, Sweet Lou Ferlin, the Johnson Group, the Keg, and of course, Trans Canada Brewing Company. Thank you to them. Thank you to all of you. We're going to do this again, another matinee tomorrow as they take on the Washington Capitals trying to bounce back. They could sure use it to change the way we talked about them in this podcast. Uh, hey, all you out there who think there's nothing to worry about, keep on trucking. All you who are worried, well, we'll be here to talk about it if there's any reason to worry after the game tomorrow. We'll talk to you then. Bye-bye.